G'day there, Nick Bowditch here. Today, in my COVID cancel keynote, I was going to be in South Australia speaking in front of a non-profit audience, and the topic of the talk was around things that hold us back, um, as opposed to what we can do to maybe give us a little bit of a help, as opposed to a hindrance in our mind, in our mental health, and in our thinking. Um, that was the brief that was given to me. So today, the talk that I would have been giving on that uh, topic in South Australia. I'm now going to be giving in my lounge room here in Terrigal in New South Wales. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, I, I sort of pledged a little while ago that I would just start to do the keynotes and the public speaking work that I was going to be paid for before um, COVID kind of stepped in and changed all of our lives uh, for, for a little while, hopefully not too long, hopefully not too much longer, but um, you know, and I would just instead just keep churning out the, the events as if I was doing them there just to keep my hand in as well as maybe, you know, spread a couple of messages which might be helpful um, to you as you watch this as well today, hopefully anyway. So the title of today's talk is Held Back or Propelled Forward. Uh, and I think, I think that there are three things that hold me back and there are three things that potentially give me a propel forward, give me a propulsion forward in my life and in my thinking, in my relationships, in my businesses, um, just in my general kind of mental health and my general behavior as well. I always talk about, this is just a, as an aside, I, I talk about me a lot. I talk about the things that hold me back, the things that propel me forward, because I don't feel like if I'm, if I'm or anybody is standing up saying, you know, what you need to do is this, or you should, or you must do this, like, I know that doesn't really resonate that well with me as a consumer of this stuff. Um, so I tend to kind of turn that around and instead put it back on me and say, you know, this is what helps me. This is, uh, this is how I find this to be. This is how I find um, benefit from this stuff. If, if I was you, I would do this, that, that kind of uh, language which works better for me. So today I'm going to talk about the three things that hold me back and the three things that I know propel me forward as well. Okay, so let's go. Firstly, I'm at Nick Bowdish across all the socials. Um, you can find me across every single platform. That's how you find me, at Nick, Nick Bowdish, uh, except for YouTube, which is just a little bit slightly different because of the, the URL of YouTube. But if you type in Nick Bowdish, you can find all my videos there. That may be where you're watching today. Today, my, my aim of this talk really is to just get you to think differently. And really, what I want to do, my main aim, is to have you think differently, maybe just about one thing. And that one thing will be different for everybody who's in the room, or wherever you're watching this today. Um, but, you know, I feel like if we just think differently about one thing every now and again, then we're going to change our lives. We're going to change our story, we're going to change our existence on Earth, we're going to change our relationships, we're going to change what we bring to the world. And I think that is potentially a good thing sometimes too. So I'd love you to think differently about one thing. I might check in at the end um, to see if I've achieved that today. First thing is, I want you to th think about how you frame your story. Right, so this might be the thing that you think differently about, might not, but I, I'm a really big believer in, uh, in storytelling for a start. That's the majority of the work I do is to help businesses and people and brands um, tell their story better, or differently at least. But the problem is that sometimes we just don't frame our story very well. Sometimes we're not very good uh, deliverers of our own story um, because sometimes we're living somebody else's, you know, which is kind of sad. Um, so firstly, I think the first thing I want to talk about is then how, how I reframe my own story and how you might do the same because how you tell your story to the world is how the world listens to it. There's no doubt about that. If you're living somebody else's story, if somebody else's outer voice has become your inner voice and that's become your story, then that's obvious to the world too. But I think there's some value in just reassessing how, how you're telling your story to the world first and foremost, right? So I always start with this slide. This is the true representation of my life. You know, these, these four beautiful little things um, are the greatest gifts that the universe has ever given my life and probably ever will. Uh, and I'm just inordinately grateful for them. Um, to be in my life, but I always start this because 
whilst I can get sort of introduced, you know, to an audience as the only Australian to have worked at both Facebook and Twitter, the only person in the Southern Hemisphere to have worked in marketing at both Facebook and Twitter. Like there's a lot of different positioning statements and different kind of marketing speak that I can that I can be presented to and that and that somebody says immediately before I jump up on stage and deliver a talk like this. And that's great. I mean, those things are true. That you know, that that is who I am, or at least part of who I am, that I do come back from this startup background. I come from a learning and development background. I come from a small business background. All of those things are true. And if you Google me, you'll certainly find those things to be true as well. And that's definitely one side of my life, you know. But the other side of my life, the other side of me, is that I'm also somebody who lives with challenges mentally. You know, my mental health isn't isn't always great. Um, my mindset isn't always great. Uh, I have come through and survived and been resilient from a lot of trauma in my life. And there's, those things leave scars. And sometimes those scars are, are, are bigger and badder and uglier than others. Uh, some days those scars are barely visible, if at all. So I, I, I'm sort of hesitant to st- when people talked about me and t- introduced me in a certain way. I'm like, yeah, that's, those things are true, but I want to give you the whole picture. I want to reframe that story. Part of reframing the story, though, is to talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, but in a way that benefits me, in a way that serves me moving forward, right? So these things are all true about me. You know, right? This is the, there's no, there's no denying it. There's no. I'm not trying to escape it. I'm telling you quite openly about these things. You know, I do live with depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. I live with these things. I don't struggle against them. I don't battle against them. I live with them. They are part of me. And if I don't tell that story for whatever reason, then I'm not being authentic. I'm not really showing you who I am. You know, and a lot of those, there are a lot of reasons people don't stand up and say, yeah, look, I live with depression or yeah, this anxiety is fucking killing me. Or, you know, I had some trauma when I was a kid and I still suffer for that. Like a lot of the reasons why people don't say that stuff is because of the shame they feel about how you are going to react to that and how you react to that determines whether they're even going to bring it up or sometimes whether they're even going to feel that stuff themselves. Right, so that's the first thing I want to say is I, those things are absolutely things that I live with. Um, I, I obsessively think about things. I, I, obsessive thinking is a problem for me. I used to have addictions that that controlled my life. They don't anymore, thank God. But you know, they I, I, that's been part of my life before. I have been unreliable in my life, and I still am a little bit. I'm extremely socially awkward. Um, something I wish I I wasn't, but I am still. You know. I fatigue easily, I take risks, all these things are potentially flaws in my character and, you know, potentially things that I would see as downsides to me and how other people might see as downsides to me too. That's if I let other people frame my story. That's if I let my past frame my story, right? One of my, one of my favorite quotes in the world is a Carl Jung quote and it's, I am not what happened to me, I am what I choose to become. And that is a really big mantra for me in my life. I get to make that choice every single day. I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. And part of what I choose to become is how I reframe that story and tell it differently, right? So I choose to think of those things instead of being character flaws, I choose to think of those things as being my superpowers. You know, the the fact that I have these things that I live with aren't detractions from my character they're actually what builds my character they are part of me if you know me you know me as somebody who lives with all those things right i don't i don't try to hide that stuff anymore those that doesn't help me you're as sick as your secrets and the more secrets i keep about my mental illness the sicker i am the worse my mental illness is so i choose to think of those things about uh, you know as these things about uh, being superpowers they are literally what makes me me but they have upsides too you know because of those things i actually live with these things i have great empathy i understand human connection you know i i understand human connection because it has literally saved my life you know that's that's how i know connecting to humans is a good thing for me is a safe thing for me 
And the really big part of it being a superpower is when my depression is at its worst, my creativity is at its best. I wrote a best-selling book, Reboot Your Thinking, um, and the majority of that was written in bed, so depressed that I couldn't get out of bed. Um, and the reason that works is because of that, because my, when my depression has its best, my creativity is, my, when my depression is at its highest, its worst, it's when I'm the most creative. It's when I can tap into that stuff really well and I can make and say and write and create beautiful things when my head is at its worst. It's kind of, you know, a, a paradox in that way. But it's something I'm really grateful for. That's because that's why it's a superpower for me. So, you know, I, I challenge people a lot with this, but what are your superpowers, you know? What are the things that that make you annoying in some ways, even to yourself, maybe to other people? And then how can you reframe those things? And maybe you just stop the video for a couple of minutes here and write these things down and, and reframe them, you know? So are you um, are you always late? Okay, what's the superpower of always being late? That you're actually, when you come, you're worth it. That you, you know, when you come, you're ready, you're prepared. Um, uh, maybe you're somebody who um, really cares about grammar and stuff like that. And other people get really annoyed at that. But the superpower is that when somebody wants something written really beautifully and really correctly, they'll come to you. Uh, you know, I, I'm too loud. People say that I'm too loud. I'm too outspoken, right? But the upside of that, the superpower version of that is, yeah, but I'm heard. You know, and that is a really great superpower to have, especially in, in 2020, 2020. So we sound so weird when you say it like that, but yeah. So I just encourage you to stop the video for a second now. Think about that. What are your superpowers? How do you reframe your story um, to turn the negatives into positives? Okay, so welcome back. So the three things that I'm going to start with are the three negative things, right? The things that hold me back. And and when I say that, I just want to reiterate again, it's what holds me back. And I say it's what holds us back, but it's really it comes from my own life experience, my own lived experience, right? So there's three things that I think really hold me back from being the best version of myself. The first one is fear. And I think this is as universal a concept as there ever will be, that everybody feels fear. Everybody. I mean, animals feel fear, you know, like it's, it's, a, it's a really understandable thing. It's a comprehensible thing. Sometimes it's a helpful thing. You know, it keeps us alive. It keeps us safe. Don't touch that. I'm scared about touching that because I think it might sting me. I'm scared about climbing up that mountain because I might fall off. Like those things are actually really helpful and make sense for us to have some fear in our life. But alternatively, a lot of the time I think we fear we have more fear about what might happen if we do something than what would actually happen as a downside of doing that thing. You know, the worst thing that could happen if we do it is often not as bad as what we're fearing in doing it in the first place. And that's why fear holds us back, you know, and it can be a terribly stifling thing. I know in my own life it can be a terribly stifling thing. You know, I, if you think about something you're fearful of and, and if I challenge you to do it today... How do you feel about that? You know, how does that make you feel? And, I, and, and more often than not, it makes you feel, it puts you in a place where you're just like, well, I'm just not going to do it. I, I'm just going to back away from that and not, not have a go. The sad part about that is that's why a lot of people are not in a relationship they want to be or why they won't ask somebody to be in a relationship with them who they want it to be. It's also a reason why somebody is still in a relationship they don't want to be in because they fear being alone, they fear change. You know, a lot of people won't ask for promotion, a lot of people won't apply for that job, a lot of people won't leave their job. You know, whatever it is that fear is holding you in, it's almost always, always also holding you back. You know, there's, uh, I think sometimes when we talk about fear, the next thing that people talk about is bravery. And I just think bravery has kind of been bastardized a little bit in the world too, because, you know, the opening bat for Australia can sprain his ankle on the first day of the test match and he, he was so brave to keep going, he bravely fought on, you know. That's not bravery. You know, like landing in Anzac Cove and having to run up the beach and onto the mountain while people are shooting live bullets at you, that's bravery, you know. Like, I think sometimes our, our sense of what's brave has been kind of a little bit messed up. And, and I think 
the real basis of that is that I don't think the opposite of fear is bravery. I think the opposite of fear is curiosity, is, is even wanting to or, or imagining a different existence for yourself, imagining a different alternative, imagining a different option of moving forward. Sometimes that can be the bravest thing of all, right? So the opposite of fear isn't bravery, it's curiosity. And therefore, what are you going to do today that's, that you, that's interesting to you, that's, that, that you're curious about? You know, um, a lot of people would never, there, there must be so many unwritten books, unrecorded albums, unpainted paintings because people just aren't curious enough or just care too much about what everyone else might think about it, that that fear holds them back. And I think that's kind of sad. The number, well, the number two thing, the second thing that I think is a really big thing that holds me back and maybe it might be too for you is is criticism and there's a big difference here between feedback and criticism right feedback is a gift there's there's no two ways about that if you've got the right if you're receiving in the right way and if it's sent to you transmitted to you in the right way feedback is an absolute gift the problem is who you take that feedback from right as, as Brené Brown talks about, if you're not in the arena having a go, then I don't, I'm not going to listen to you, right? There's very few people who I would listen to when they come and tell me what I should do in my speaking career or what I should do on stage, what I should do, like doing this, you know? If somebody said, oh, you know, you should wear, you should wear a shirt with buttons on it or you shouldn't say fuck or you should do this or you should do that. Now, if that person giving me that feedback is actually a speaker who's on stage and putting their ass out there to get kicked like I am every day, then yeah, I'll listen to you. If you're somebody who's never set foot on stage and never will, then I'm sorry, I'm not listening to you. I, I care about what your opinion. I care that you have one, but I'm not taking it on. Your critique means nothing to me, right? Like, like, it's like if I tried to give an accountant some advice on, on, their, on, on being an accountant, like I have a clue. If, or, or, you know, if I try to tell somebody who's a really great singer or something, like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't get to make that choice. If I'm not in there having a go, then I don't get a vote. Likewise, other people, if, you know, if you're, not, if you're not doing what I'm doing, then you can't critique what I'm doing. You can, but I'm not going to listen. You know, maybe you shouldn't listen to that stuff either. You know, I really support you to think about who you're listening to. Because so often, people who give advice or feedback are doing that to validate their own position, are doing that to validate their own story. You know, oh, don't get too big for your boots, don't get outside your lane, you know, don't do this, don't do that. Because what you're doing if you do that is you you make me have the light shone on me and I wonder if I'm enough, right? So don't listen to people who are covering their fear by attacking you for investigating your own curiosity. If they're just covering their fear by having a go at you, they don't get it, they don't get it, say. They don't get a vote. They don't get to get in your head. So many people I know from, because I work a lot in startup, right? So many people in startup are, are slow starting or won't make decisions or change their business because their mum told them that that logo is no good or their, their uncle told, you know, who gives a shit what they think? Like, they don't, if they're not a designer, don't, they're not, they don't get a say in the logo, right? If they're, if they're not actually putting everything they have at risk to, to launch a startup, then I'm sorry, why the fuck are you listening to them? Right? We've got to be more brutal with that. We've got to be more honest with that because we're held back so much by the curiosity of others and the criticism of others that, that we shouldn't even be hearing in the first place, right? Who do you listen to? I'd really encourage you to think about this, like, like who, who are the four or five people, and it should be no more than that, probably, that you actually think their opinion counts and matters to you. And at the moment, you might be sitting there thinking, well, fuck, I've got a hundred people who I, think, who I listen to. And, and I think maybe that's too many. So I'd encourage you just to think about that. Like, who do you actually listen to? who's been through what you've been through, who's, who has your best interests at heart, who, who knows what they're talking about. How many people are on that list? 
And if it's more than fingers on your hand, perhaps you're being too generous and allowing yourself to be critiqued by far too many people. The other thing about criticism and curiosity is that it requires a lot of vulnerability to, to make anything, right? There is no creativity without vulnerability. And so that's the other reason why I think not everyone has a go. Not everyone has a, the option to tell me what's what because I'm making myself vulnerable here. God, I'm making myself super vulnerable here and every time I do this, right? So, so I'm not going to listen to somebody who's not making themselves vulnerable, judging me on me doing so. Like, it's just not fair. <laughs> it's just not fair. But we do it, don't we? Right? You're probably doing it right now. There's no creativity without vulnerability. To create something requires you to be vulnerable. To say, here, this is what I have created. This is what I've painted. This is what I've cooked. This is what I've drawn. This is what I think. This is what I feel. That stuff is vulnerable, man. And for someone to just take that and go, well, actually, it's a bit shit. When they're not doing the same is reprehensible. And it's reprehensible for you to listen to that person. I'd really support you not to do that. Because keep this in mind, right? The loudest boos come from the cheapest seats. The biggest mouths, blah, 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 come from people a long way away from the arena. I've done a bit of boxing in my life and anybody else who's done some boxing in their life knows how hard it is to get there, how much vulnerability you have to put yourself through it, a little bit of bravery, I suppose, too. And then, you know, you, you, you fight at a fight night and you, you get your ass kicked potentially. And as you're walking back through the crowd, the crowd's all full of people who look like they've never run a block, a city block in their life, far less done three rounds of anything. And they're judging you and telling you what you should have done. Like, sorry, no, they, 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 don't, they don't get a vote. <laughs> they don't get to voice that opinion. The loudest booze come from the cheapest seats. The third thing that holds us back is, I think, a really, again, a universal feeling. I didn't realize it was as universal as it is, but it really is a universal thing. As The more I work with people one-on-one -on -one in a therapy environment, the more I, I do this sort of stuff and get connection with people and, and be in relationship with people enough for them to tell me what's going on for them, is the fear that you are just not enough, right? It's not, you know, uh, I'm too fat, I'm too thin, I'm too tall, I'm too short, I'm too rich, I'm too poor, I'm too dumb, I'm too smart. Any of those things, they're, they're crippling too. Those core beliefs are challenging and they're difficult, but the greatest one in terms of weight and importance and the ability to fuck you up is that thought, geez, am I just not enough? Am I not enough for you? Am I not enough for the world? Am I not enough to be? Am I not enough to exist, to exert, to, to have effort in life, to create something? Like it's really sad feeling that I have felt lots and lots and lots in my life and I, I venture a lot of us have, you know. Part of that am I, am I enough feeling, part of one of the sort of kindling under that fire is this feeling that you're an imposter in your own life. You know, the imposter syndrome thing that people talk about is really big, you know. I know that when I speak on stage, <laughs> hopefully I'll do that again one day, but, you know, when, when I was, was doing these, but on stages full of, in front of auditoriums full of people, generally about 45 seconds before I go on stage every single time, that record starts playing in my head that says, you know, today's the day they work it out, that you are full of shit, brother. You've got no idea what you're doing. You're hopeless at this. You're a bullshit artist. You're this, you're that. All that stuff that's just saying, you know, you're an imposter. What are you doing here? How dare you get up on the stage and tell people, you know, try to motivate people or try to tell people to think differently or, or be a better version of themselves. Who the fuck are you to do that? That stuff plays in my head really loud about 30 seconds before I get on stage. So, you know, I've got some tips and sort of little hacks that help me work that out. And so I thought I'd share those with you today too, because I feel like that imposter syndrome is a pretty universally felt thing for humans as well. The first thing is I don't try to be perfect. I just try to be valuable. 
you know, there's this, it's so funny, right? Because I, I do live with a fair bit of crazy in my head, and, but not one of that bits of crazy is, is related to perfectionism. Thank God. You know, it's not, it's not something that I don't have, you know, that I don't have to deal with, which is great. I think that done is better than perfect. I think that, you know, perfect is the enemy of good. So I, I'm very much in the, in the mode of just, just put it out there and see how you go, you know, have a crack. Um, so that's the first thing. And I think, I think in fighting that, that perfectionism, if that is something you live with, maybe you could focus a little bit more on just trying to add value, right? Not being perfect, just trying to add value. It takes a lot of pressure off. And it also relieves that imposter syndrome a little bit too. That's the first thing. Second thing is I, I try not to compare myself to others. It's hard, right? Because sometimes people people are actively comparing me to other people and they tell you about it. So it's sort of difficult to escape that. But, but that's okay if they're doing it. It's not okay if I'm doing it. So I try not to compare myself to others. That helps also. Um, <laughs> the third thing I do is I keep a nice file. So on my Google Drive in the cloud, every time somebody... Not every time. Every time I see somebody who's saying something kind or supportive or constructive or positive uh, or negative sometimes if it's in the right vein about the work that I do and there's somebody who I would listen to about these things, um, I'll just take a little screenshot of that, you know, be it on Twitter or in a blog comment or something um, or Facebook or whatever. And I just take a screenshot of it and I put it in the Google Drive in my nice file. And sometimes I'm not feeling that great. <laughs> when I might feel like that I'm not enough, that imposter syndrome really is cooking hard in my head, I just dial up and, and look into that nice file and just look at things that have been said about me by complete strangers, unsolicited by me, so I feel like they're truthful. And, and you know, that sort of encourages me to say, you know, you, you're doing all right, you're in the right place, people are listening, you're having an effect, you know, that's that stuff's helpful for me, you know. So that helps keeping a nice file. And then the last thing I think is just just put yourself out there. You know, nobody knows what they're doing anyway. So you might as well just have a crack. And 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 when I simplify it as as, as easy as that, it actually cuts through a lot of that crap that, that holds me back in the imposter space, that holds me back in the in the am I enough space is just have a go anyway, because nobody knows nobody knows what they're fucking doing anyway. So you might as well have a crack and see if you can make a difference. You know, those, those things really, really help me. So the three things that hold me back, again, hold me back and maybe holding, back you, holding you back too, is fear, criticism, and wondering, am I enough? So going forward then, what propels us forward? What are the three things that I do that I know will help me move forward in life and move forward in my headspace and in my relationships and everything else? The first is I try to focus on fact. And my clients who I... Who I in the therapy, in the therapy part of my business, they know I talk about this a lot, and and they'll say something to me, and I'll I'll challenge them back immediately with, "Is that real? Is that real? Did that really happen? Can you show me the data that says that happened? That that's real, or is that in your head?" And any anything, every time someone says, "Well, the truth is, I think that she said, yeah, that's that's not the truth. That's not real. I think is what you think. You, there's no data around that." If you can say, yeah, here's where, here's where she wrote it, then yeah, okay, <laughs> that's real, right? But if it's not, I feel like we get caught up in a lot of shit that's not real. So a focus on fact is the first thing that, that drives me forward. The way, and I've, I've, I've talked about this before, but there's a little three-sentence kind of hack that I use a lot in my life just to work things out in that focusing on fact. And the first question is, is it real? The second question is, can I change it? And the third question then, if the entity is yes to the first two, is does it matter anyway? Because quite often I'll, uh, I'll ask the first question of myself, is that real? Like I start to have a feeling, you know, that I don't like, or start to have a memory that I don't like, or I start to think I'm less than or whatever. And then I can just go, okay, hang on, hang on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Is that real? And if the answer is no, then I give myself permission to let that feeling go. And it's done. Right, but if the answer is, uh, is that real? Well, yes, it is real. Here's, I can see what she wrote it. I heard it. They told me it. Whatever. Um, then okay. Then I go to the next one, the next question, which is, can I change it? Again, if the answer is no, I can't change it. Then I have to give myself permission to let that feeling go. If the answer is yes, I can change it. 
Then I go on to the third and most important question, and that is, does it matter anyway? The majority of what we get hooked up on and held back by isn't real, can't be changed, and doesn't fucking matter anyway. <laughs> so I think focusing on that stuff can sometimes really just be the circuit breaker in, in that focusing on fact altogether. Good storytelling is the second one. So I focus on a few different things that make me a better storyteller that actually propel me forward, right? They're things like, you know, being conversational as much as I can be with my sort of awkward social anxiety, being, you know, evocative, not provocative. You know, everyone wants you to pick a side. Nobody wants you to pick a fight. In your storytelling, you can, you can do that. You can, you can be provocative without picking a fight, being vulnerable, being authentic, being open and transparent, being bold, being fun, right? Being surprising, being you. Sometimes that's all that's required, you know, and it's sometimes it's the thing that we struggle the most with in that. So that's the storytelling thing. And then the third thing I think that, that propels me forward, and I am... 100% convinced propels us all forward as individuals and community is kindness. You know, this it's something that used to be really just part of us without having to be taught or promoted or encouraged. But kindness is the greatest free hit ever. It's the greatest gift humans have or can give to, to another human. It's the greatest feeling to have somebody give it to you. You know, I often talk about in a business sense, you're not, you're never going to lose business by being kind. You're only ever going to gain it. A brand or a company or a startup that focuses on kindness will always win because kindness will always win. We, we, we love it and it's never, ever wasted. You know, it's never wasted. There's, there's no, you know, nobody can, nobody's ever going to say, oh, geez, can't stand that Nick, like he's just so fucking kind, he drives me crazy, you know, that doesn't happen, <laughs> there's never an, an over-exuberance of kindness, if it's inauthentic, sure, that's annoying, but genuine kindness rarely is, you know, so just to, just to sort of take one step back and think, okay, what are the three things that hold me back, they are fear, absolutely, the fear of unknown, the fear of not taking that step, the fear of what might be, um, Listening to somebody else's fear also, which leads into the second one, is criticism. Who am I going to take that criticism from? Who am I going to listen to? Who aren't I going to listen to? And how well, how good am I at distinguishing the difference between feedback and criticism? Because feedback is a gift that we should never you know, knock back. But criticism, take that or leave it by whoever's giving it, you know. Then the third thing that holds me back is that feeling of, am I enough? And there's lots of ways we can sort of investigate that and crush it a little bit too, you know, because I feel like we can do a better job of working out if we're enough. Everybody is enough. Everybody brings the same human value when they're born to when they die. You know, a child born today in Syria and a child born in Potts Point in Sydney, some real flash joint in Sydney, they have the same human value when they're born and they will have that same human value their whole life until they die. That never changes. Their circumstances can change, their behavior can change, their, their money can change, their nutrition can change, all those things can change, but their human value doesn't, which means when they're born, they are enough, and when they die, they will still be enough. That never, ever changes. So they're the three things that hold me back, the three things that move me forward in life and I know you know it's, it's hard sometimes to kind of focus on the things that really really do propel me forward because sometimes the noise the greater noise is coming from those things that hold me back but the three things that hold me back that propel me forward that I can remember and focus on and regenerate each day hopefully is focusing on fact being a good storyteller and telling my own story not somebody else's version of it and operating with kindness, leading with kindness, because kindness wins. We started today talking about fear. And so I want to end today with a little challenge for you that I often end most of my keynotes with, and you might have seen this before, but it's a question that relates directly to that, and it is, what would you do today if fear wasn't a factor? 
What would you do today if you weren't afraid? Because I guarantee you everything you want, everything you're waiting for, everything you desire is on the other side of fear. And I challenge myself with this every day. You know, what would I do today if I wasn't afraid? And 99% of the time I don't do it because the fear is too strong. And I want to be open about that. I don't want to say, oh, this is what I do every day. I'm killing it. You should too. But I know also that when I do do that, when I do challenge myself to the things that scare the shit out of me, then I'm often rewarded at the other end of it with realizing it probably wasn't that great a thing to worry about in the first place. And I've finally attained something which I wouldn't have otherwise had the fear held me back. So I want to challenge you today. What would you do today if you weren't afraid? I'd love to hear that in the comments below or you can contact me at Nick Bowdish across all the socials. I'd love to get your feedback on that. It's something that you have gone ahead with, something that you've challenged yourself with um, that otherwise would have scared the shit out of you. I'd love you to do that today and let me know what it was. All right, have a great day wherever you are. I hope that's helped, those three things that held me back and the three things that propelled me forward. Hopefully that resonates with you too. Thank you so much for engaging with me on these COVID cancelled keynotes. It's so weird doing it in front of no one in my lounge room as opposed to doing it in front of audiences all the time. And I'm missing that terribly. You know, my ego misses that. But also, you know, this content I think is different when it's when there's an audience I can feed back from. You know, I can... I can feed off a little bit, but I hope you're getting something from these if you're still watching them. And uh, if this is the first one you've ever watched, you can go back and watch some others too by just Googling that or in my YouTube channel. Hope you're having a great day wherever you are. Find some kindness. Find some kindness today for yourself. Start with yourself. And then you'll find, you know, you might actually be actually be more able to be kind to others and see the rewards from that also because kindness wins. Kindness always wins. All right. See ya.